Hello, everyone. Welcome to San Francisco Beginnings of Korean Immigration. My name is Rosemary Nam, and I'm the curator of this exhibit. Thank you so much for joining us today on this Zoom talk. As you all know, this exhibit was supposed to be a physical exhibit at the Oakland Asian Cultural Center, but due to COVID, today's program, as well as the entire exhibit, is going virtual. I am here today with my very special guest, Gail Huang. She's a third generation San Francisco Korean. Both sides of her family, the Huangs and the Shins, um, trace back to over a hundred years of immigration history in San Francisco. They are two of the oldest San Francisco families that I know, and I'm very thrilled to have Gail with us today. So after my introduction, she's going to spend um, some time um, sharing her um, family immigration history with us. So um, I want to remind everyone that um, this is a short program, just about 25, 30 minutes. And today is just a teaser to pique your interest in the subject. If you like what you hear in our talk today, I encourage you to go to the virtual exhibit, which you can find on this direct link that you see at the top of this page. Or if you can't remember that, the easiest way is to go to the Oakland Asian Cultural Center's main website at oacc.cc and find the thumbnail for the exhibit and click on the thumbnail and that will take you to the virtual exhibit as well. Um, so um, before I start, I want to thank so many people. There are so many people that helped me with this exhibit. First and foremost, I must thank Edwin Lee, who inspired me about eight years ago to study immigration history. Um, Regina Lim, my intern designer, for her beautiful job of designing and layout. Um, Akemi Imai and Rachel Lee of Oakland Asian Cultural Center, they have been wonderful in helping me put together the exhibit and more recently putting up the virtual gallery. I also must thank Sally Lee, the executive director of Oakland, Oakland um, Asian Cultural Center. She was the first person to suggest doing this exhibit about a year ago and also found the sponsors to make it happen. So thank you, Sally. Um, I must also thank Phil Shin, Gail's cousin, who has been my old friend, and he actually first shared his Shin family history and introduced me to Gail. So thank you, Phil. And um, last but not least, I thank my two sponsors, the Korean Consul General of San Francisco. Consul General Park has been a constant support for my research over the years, so thank you. And my dear friends at San Francisco Korean American Community Foundation, thank you so much. Okay, now a brief background and introduction about this exhibit. I started to take an interest in Korean immigration history when I met Edwin Lee about eight years ago. Edwin is a second generation Korean American. Um, here he is right here. And when I first met him, he was in his 80s. And um, this is Edwin Lee on the left, and with his old friend, um, Ralph Ahn, who's the youngest son of An Chang Ho. And we attended an event together in Dainuba in 2012. So Edwin told me that um, both of his parents came to Angel Island in 1913 and 1917. Until then, I had no idea that Koreans came to Angel Island. I had assumed that Korean immigration started in Hawaii when contract laborers first landed in Honolulu in 1903, and that um, immigration to the mainland US um, just happened gradually in later years. So when I learned about more about Edwin's family and started to do some more research on my own, I realized that first Kore Koreans came to San Francisco before they ever went to Hawaii. So political exiles and student activists like Dr. Sajet Pill, um, his American name being Philip Jason, he landed in San Francisco as early as 1885. There were a few others um, and um, there were also ginseng merchants known to have been in San Francisco starting in the late, late 1800s. So this is kind of the timeline here. Um, but really, the Korean community did not 
began to form until 1902 when um, some student activists like An Chang Ho and his young wife, Helen, arrived in San Francisco. Also, um, Reverend David Lee um, arrived in 1903 and a dozen others. And the difference um, that was made by them was they started to organize and build a community, which was very important. So here's An Chang Ho here and David, uh, Reverend David Lee. So aside from the student activists, um, there were two other main groups that came to San Francisco. One was Korean laborers who initially went to Hawaii, made a secondary migration to San Francisco in 1905 until 1907. Um, and then the migration had to be stopped because of the gentleman's agreement, which I defer you to the exhibit to find out about. But about a thousand of these laborers came to San Francisco. And the author of this amazing memoir, Ursuk Char, um, this memoir, The Golden Mountain, is an amazing story about uh, Mr. Char coming as a boy of 10 years old to Hawaii and then making a secondary migration to San Francisco. So if you're interested in um, reading about um, Korean early Korean immigrant, this is a great one. I would highly recommend it. And then the third group to come was starting in 1910, Angel Island Immigration Stage, Station opens and um, number of students, family members and picture brides um, came through Angel Island. And of course, this is when um, Edwin Lee's parents, right here, Lee Bam Young and Kim Hes Hu, um, come in 1913 and 1917. 1910 is also the year that Japanese occupies Korea. And there is a lot of fear in the country amongst the Koreans about their future and their country. And they many flee and many have to flee secretly because Japanese do not want Koreans to leave the country. So Gail will tell us more about her grandparent who um, had to free, flee secretly. So these three groups form the foundation of the earliest Korean community in San Francisco. So once they came, where did they live? How did they survive? Most Koreans could not live, stay in San Francisco because there were strong um, anti-Asian sentiments and Koreans had a hard time getting a job here. The few who were able to stay um, had to work in very humble jobs, such as being a schoolboy or school, school girl, which was another term for students who worked as domestic workers by the mornings and the evenings and went to school during the day. There were also dishwashers and busboys. Um, some families, as Gail will tell you, um, eventually started their own small businesses like laundries, diners, and grocery stores. A majority of the Koreans, however, could not stay in San Francisco and had to migrate and work as farm workers. Um, they went to, here's a uh, California map, and they went to Southern California as early as 1903 and started to pick oranges in the orange, orange groves, in particular in the Riverside area. And An Chang Ho and his wife Helen um, moved down there and lived and worked among the workers and established a small Korean migrant camp called the Pachapa Camp in Riverside. 1906, um, Koreans also started to go down to cities like Hanford and Visalia in the San Joaquin Valley and started to pick grapes and vineyards and um, pick fruits at orchards. Um, they eventually would move out to smaller towns such as Dainuba and Beedley, which became quite a settlement of Koreans by the 20s and the 30s. Um, Sacramento Valley, starting in 1910s, there was a big rice farming boom, and so Koreans became rice farmers. Um, and this was significant because this was the first time that Koreans were able to elevate their status from laborers to um, tenant farmers, which gave them a share in the uh, uh, profit from the sale of the crop. So a few uh, made a big fortune 
and they made um, significant contributions to the Korean community as well as the independence movement. So the thing that stands out about San Francisco beginnings is the organization. San Francisco was the organizational hub in the very early days. And this was significant and enormously um, important in building the community because as I just mentioned, Koreans were a very small group and scattered all over California and also some outside of California. So um, the San Francisco Koreans and the leaders were, um, were quite savvy in organizing early and effectively. Um, so 1903, Friendship Society is the first Co Korean organization to be established in San Francisco. And its mission is to support the immigrant community and all the needs that are there. 1905, the Korean, first Korean political organization, Hongnip Association, is found in San Francisco. And it also publishes the first Korean newspaper called Gongnip Shimbo, which is, becomes a very important tool for communicating with the scattered population. Again, in 1905, Korean Mission is the first Korean Christian church that's established in San Francisco. And they publish Dedo, which is a monthly magazine starting in 1908. And then last but not least, 1909, the Korean National Association is um, established and headquartered in San Francisco. And um, it is the first time that um, all of the Korean organizations that are existing both in the mainland US and in Hawaii consolidates under the umbrella of this association. Um, so this is a big, big event and Korean National Association or Kukminhe in Korean um, becomes the representative body and the voice for all Korean Americans on both um, domestic matters as well as um, the independence movement to end Japanese occupation of Korea. And of course there is a Hung Zadan with which Gail will talk about. I ran out of space here, but she will talk about that um, and her grandparents' involvement with that very important organization as well. So I have a lot to say, but that's about all the time I have. Um, before I turn it over to Gail, I have to talk, say one thing about the ship manifest on the left here on the screen. This is the ship manifest from the ship that her grandparents, Huang Sa san and Huang Te san who you see down here, um, took to come to San Francisco in 1913. And when Gail shared this um, ship manifest with me, it captured um, the theme of this exhibit, San Francisco beginning so well that I asked her if we could use it as um, part of the design for the promotional material and the exhibit. And she graciously agreed. So thank you, Gail, so for sharing this precious historical document. And Gail, take it away. And just let me know when you want me to advance the um, slides. Okay. Uh, so, as Rosemary said, when I first saw that document, and it was only about maybe eight, eight or nine years ago, it was so moving that I saw my grandparents' name on the bottom of, as part of the passenger list, and it just brought home to me the, it just made it so real. Now, I didn't grow up knowing the history of my grandparents at all. Um, I'm third generation, so which means, you know, I was born here, my parents were born here, and my grandparents immigrated from Korea. I was tremendously influenced by the civil rights movement and wanted to know more about the history of our people. So I started out asking my mom and dad, tell me about Halmini and Harabaji and why did they come, what were their goals, what were their hopes, and they didn't really know that much. And so at first I was shocked that they didn't know, they didn't know the dates, they didn't know um, about their journey. So luckily my dad spoke some Korean and he said, let's go and talk to Harabaji Huang. This is um, 
uh, his dad. And um, so we went and we interviewed and this started this long interview project where I interviewed my grandparents and their friends and uncovered this amazing history of Koreans coming to the US. So just briefly, Huang Sa Sun and his wife, Huang Tae Sun, this was in, around, well, as Rosemary said, 1910, Japanese, the, the Japanese took over Korea. And uh, my grandfather was part of an underground organization organizing against the Japanese coming into Korea. And they were part of an organized um, underground organization. And many of his friends were captured and tortured. And he, he felt, his brother had already immigrated to the US. He felt like at this point, he wanted to leave and continue the fight for Korean independence in this country. So in the middle of winter, disguised as, well, he crossed the Yalu River, which borders the northern part of Korea. He was born in the northern part of Korea, into China. When he arrived in China, he put on Chinese clothes. And when he was stopped by the Japanese police, he pretended that he was Chinese from a, a small remote province in northern China. And he made his way down to Shanghai, where he boarded the boat. He came to San Francisco, landed in 1913 with his wife. Um, this was just an amazing story that he told. He ended up uh, settling in San Francisco with hopes of being able to continue his education. He was a high school teacher in Korea, continue his education. But because of all the discrimination and the anti-Asian laws, he ended up working, renting a small storefront right on the outskirts of Chinatown, cleaning and alterations. And so this is a picture of him. He called it the Korean tailor shop. And I just am just tickled that he was so proud of being Korean that he plastered in spite of the, uh, the discriminatory um, environment that he was living in, Korean tailor and alterations. So uh, this is a picture of his wife and my dad and my dad's sister Elizabeth in front of their Korean tailor shop. Many of the Koreans, you can go ahead and skip the, to the next. Uh, he became he went to school to Pacific School of Religion and was ordained and became a minister. And he was the first Korean minister in the, well, the first Korean United Methodist Church, which is established in San Francisco. So in 1913, he led this dedication service. He presided until the 1950s and actually stepped down voluntarily because he felt that he wanted younger he was so humble, he wanted the younger people to take over the, as being pastor of the church. Next. <laughs> okay. Um, all of the Koreans who came at the time were politically active. The church was the center of, the, of all of their, their lives, their social lives, their political lives, um, education. And so one of the organizations that he, he proudly stated I was the ninth member of, and An Chang Ho, my grandfather's uh, in the first row, second from the right, sitting next to An Chang Ho. And uh, they formed the Hung Sadan, uh, war proudly had their meetings, and they believed in nurturing the, their intellect, their emotional, and their physical and mental um, capabilities to better themselves so that they, their goal was to eventually return as healthy, uh, smart, dedicated uh, citizens to Korea with an independent Korea. You can see the picture of the goose in the back and that was their symbol. 
my grandfather always wore a little pin that had a, a picture of a goose on it, which I never understood until he told me about this. It was so moving. He said, geese, the symbol of the goose is that geese, we all fly together and uh, we share the leadership, we're cooperative. So that was their values that they shared. And in the back row, you see my maternal uh, grandfather, Shin Dal Yun, who's my mom's mom. So they were part of the same organization. So my dad uh, was the first grad, one of the first Korean graduates at San Francisco State University. And this is a picture of his graduation. And it was so important to my grandparents because they wanted to continue their education and were unable to. And they were so proud of my dad, who in spite of the discrimination that they, he faced grow, growing up in the 20s and 30s and 40s, he went there, um, got his degree in physical education and wanted to be a teacher, a PE teacher, loved sports and was told that uh, they, San Francisco was not hiring Asians to become teachers and as a result ended up going, which was a wonderful job working at uh, the Chinese rec center, Chinese playground in San Francisco, Chinatown, and was loved by the hundreds of kids that he influenced. So moving on to the Shin side. So, um, so Shin Dao Yun and his wife, Shin Sunhi, my Halmani and Harabaji, um, she came as a picture bride in 1916. Shin Dao Yun was a little bit older than her. They married and lived in the Sacramento Central Valley. And um, after they married, they ended up having six children. Five of them are pictured here. Every single one of them, because they had to move from uh, town to town with the crops, every single one of them was born in a different town. So I, my, and I, you know, my grandmother, how many Shin, would talk about how much work it was and the kids were so rambunctious and would be um, playing all the time, fighting all the time. And so she literally raised, while working in the fields, raised her six children. When they, they eventually moved to San Francisco and like many of the other Koreans, were able to rent out spaces and worked in uh, barber shops, hair salons, restaurants. So this is my grand grandfather, and he worked at a pool hall and restaurant on Kearney Street in San Francisco. And then he moved to another um, small business called Star Lunch, which up until just maybe a year ago actually existed. This was the actual restaurant this is my mom, we went to visit it. 605 Jackson Street in San Francisco Chinatown, 13 seats. And they, they own this restaurant, made breakfasts, lunches and dinners, served it to the local residents. They worked their butts off, got up at three in the morning, went down to the restaurant, uh, started making breakfast. My dad even worked there. Uh, he, he remembers pulling the hairs out of the pig's feet in order to get the pig's feet ready for the, for the luncheon. So, and then they went to school and after school, they came back to the restaurant and helped out at the restaurant. So, Sun Hee Shin, my grandma, amazing woman. I mean, imagine raising six children and she encouraged her, her two daughters, Ruth, Ruth is pictured here on the left, and um, Helen, the oldest sister, to go get your, um, your certification, your license to become a hairdresser so that you could run your own business. That was their, what, her survival instinct was very strong. And she encouraged her, her daughters to do that. 
which they did, and they opened up Helen Ruth Beauty Shop. So my mom worked there doing hair, cutting hair, giving perms uh, until she got married. And not to be stopped, Sun Hee Shin, after all the kids grew up, finally went back to school. And she, her dream was to continue her studies. She returned to Benjamin Franklin, Franklin Adult School in San Francisco and was the oldest graduate who graduated with her high school diploma at the age of 63. So uh, quite an amazing woman. When I interviewed my grandfather, Huang Sa Sun, I asked him, what advice do you have for your children and your grandchildren and great-grandchildren? We are now five generations of Korean Americans living in this country. And his advice to me was, always be proud to be Korean. He, to, to his dying days, was so proud of being Korean and instilled that in his children, his grandchildren. And you can see from this picture of third, fourth generations that this was at a Shin New Year's party. We all wore our Korean outfits and are feeling just ex exhibiting that pride in being Korean and if he could see us now, he would be smiling of, of how his words have been passed on through the generations. Thank you so much, Gail. You have a beautiful family and an amazing legacy that you should always be proud of. This last photo is my favorite, and it's a great reminder um, that this exhibit is about our younger generation. My greatest hope is that um, remembering and preserving the stories from San Francisco beginnings of Korean immigration will help them um, share this history with their family and their community for many, many years to come. So thank you so much for, uh, for that, Gail. Uh, and with that, I will close. Again, thank you so much for joining us. And we will be seeing you at the virtual gallery. Thank you.